invitation. And uh, for me, it's a privilege really to be here. And thank you to, once again to the Lab Center and for the European Union Center for inviting me. Um, I feel very excited, of course, uh, to be in Miami since I graduated here at the University of Miami. And I feel like Miami, Latin America now being a second home for me but also excited for presenting uh, such a new and interesting topic, such a biotrade. And I'll talk a little bit about biotrade, what do we understand under biotrade. And uh, as a European living in Latin America already seven years, um, I'm also very, very interested about how this topic develops under the Latin American EU framework, theoretical and practical framework. So I divided my presentation in uh, four parts. First, I will introduce you, I don't know if everybody is such an expert on Peru, but I will introduce you a little bit about the economical framework uh, on uh, Peru, economical life landscape, macroeconomic most of it, uh, landscape in Peru. Then I will talk a little bit about the biodiversity, since this is the topic, biodiversity and the economic value of biodiversity. Uh, then I'll talk about biotrade and what is biotrade and then how this reflects this new EU-Latin American lab relations. Um, and we'll start. So Peru economic, Peru's economic landscape at glance. So you can visit the Peruvian uh, logo, new logo presented at the New York Stock Exchange with the Peruvian ministers last year. So Peru experienced a very experiencing a very stable macroeconomic uh, landscape. Uh, the GDP for 2012 was 200 billion US dollars, growth of 7%. The growth per capita is also growing, and it's almost 6.5 million dollars, uh, 6.5 um, um, thousand per per capita. It is a stable. Um, investment policy is a low inflation, stable exchange rate. There are more than 30 international trade agreements, and not only with countries, but also with major uh, trade blocks. Uh, it's actually one of the best uh, countries, or the best country to invest in Latin America, and uh, number 36 in world ranking of the doing business. Doing business, if you don't know, uh, is uh, ranking of the World Bank. Uh, report uh, the export, which is very important when we talk about uh, native biodiversity products. It's uh, for, uh, 42.8 billion for 2012, and uh, in Peru they say that there are approximately 3 million buyers of Peruvian products uh, all over the world. Um, so this uh, also in 2012. Uh, it has been an impressive growth of biodiversity-based products and most of all non-traditional products. So I don't know if you um, know this difference, but in uh, Peru uh, we divide the export uh, basket in traditional and non-traditional products. So traditional products for us are all the raw materials, all the agriculture products like rice, like soya, and we have the non-agriculture, the non-traditional products, which are mostly the value-added products. Um, and Peru is actually the first exporter for 2012, the that is for 2012, for asparagus, for paprika, for organic banana and coffee, the second of organic cacao, the third exporter of pepper, the fourth of conventional coffee, the fifth of mango and the fifth also in avocado. And uh, since uh, Peru is a very biodiverse country, it's kind of serving as a supplier for uh, sustainably produced and commercialized agriculture goods for the world. Um, and of course, I don't want to be a cheerleader of Peru. And so to tell you that uh, despite this strong uh, macroeconomic performance and growth, there are still uh, problems and we have still these burdens of uh, poverty and uh, inequality. The overall poverty rate is 26% and uh, it is true that it has decreased a lot in the last several years from almost 50% to 26%. But we have still areas, rural, rural areas in the Amazon and in the Andean uh, regions where poverty is more than 50%. 
Uh, Peru is also the third most unequal country in, uh, in the region and you know that inequality and poverty um, are both very, they come together and they influence also economic growth of the country. Uh, Peruvian also society and is uh, moving to a middle class growth, but uh, although middle class is growing, prosperity uh, is not so evenly distributed in, uh, in the country. So you have all these uh, coastal areas, uh, cities, which are very prosperous, but uh, and you have Lima, which is the capital of Peru, where people earn 21% more than the rest of the country, but then you have all the rest of the country which where inequality is growing. And of course, uh, this poor education, poor sanitation system, also unemployment, which is around 8% in general for Peru. But again, you have this area, regions, very remote regions in Peru, uh, where unemployment is up to 40%. Um, this is just a picture of uh, Gamara. Gamara is an area of Lima. If somebody of you have uh, been to Lima, it's uh, like uh, the, the core of all the textile industry. And actually it was uh, located in a very poor area. But now I read that Gamara turns over is around 3 billion a year. And this is kind of to show this growing middle class and growing um, growing economic potential, financial and economic potential of uh, this lower middle class in Peru. And of course you have just right by Camara and by this uh, like booming area, you have the slums and this is like the two, two reality we are living, not only in Peru, actually still in other Latin America. And uh, now Peru's biodiversity and land, um, I don't know if you know about biodiversity, but biodiversity, we call biodiversity uh, all the, um, like the, the variety, the ranking and the range of all the species, all the variety of living forms. So we are also part of this biodiversity and uh, biodiversity is, uh, is forming the ecosystems. There are 108, I think, ecosystems in the world. And, uh, uh, this is something from the market in Peru and I thought it's just interesting just seeing the publics and the local <laughs> stores. It's interesting to show you that part of this Peruvian biodiversity is uh, the potato and the potatoes uh, which are from, from Peru. So Peru is among the 10 most biodiverse countries or we call it mega biodiverse countries in the world according to the UN. UN reports, uh, of course, as you can imagine, together with Brazil, with Mexico, with Colombia, it has 84 of the 104 existing ecosystems in the world. Uh, it has the largest number of bird species, the third largest number of mammals, butterflies, orchids, the first place in diversity of varieties of potatoes, the he, which is the form of chili, corn, Andean gra grains, like quinoa, which is now also very famous here. And Peru ranks also second in Latin America and fourth in the world's forest coverage. With, it has approximately 30% of the tropical Amazon forest, together with Brazil and Colombia. Uh, and when we talk about biodiversity, although we are talking about uh, species and people are species, and people are also part of the biodiversity, Biodiversity is not only an ecological concept. Actually, biodiversity is also an economic, and I will show you why, uh, but also a social concept. And uh, just to present you two reality, for example, in Peru, um, I don't know if there are some Peruvians here, <laughs> and uh, you have an area, region called uh, Huancavelica, where poverty in uh, some areas of the, the region are almost 70% more than 70%. But Juan Velica is in the middle of this Andean, um, Andean uh, mountains and actually is very famous for its Andean grains, for a lot of biodiversity-based uh, native products which have uh, an enormous now market demand internationally. 
from the other side, uh, you have uh, Madre de Dios, which is a different region, which is in the Amazon region, where poverty rate is around 12%, but the region is famous and one of the most, uh, one of the most important for export of Brazil nut. So, um, not of course, not arguing that uh, just because of the Brazil nut and the quinoa, uh, the social landscape is uh, like this, uh, but of course, this is a contributor to also more and more prosperity. And uh, biodiversity versus poverty, talking about biodiversity as a social concept, so bad response is, for example, the copper growing. Um, I don't know again what uh, if you know, but uh, unfortunately, Peru is now number one producer of, uh, of uh, coca, but coca for, uh, for the production of uh, cocaine. Uh, West Colombia was number one, and unfortunately, the last two years, uh, Peru has uh, like taken the first, the first place. But there are also some good responses. To, to this uh, biodiversity and poverty concept. And this is the product development. In the same area which produced the most coca, uh, now an enormous, am uh, enormous amount of funds, of uh, business also funds and international donor funds are invested for, um, for sponsoring uh, product development of cocoa. And actually this is the province of San Martin uh, where um, chocolate is now a booming industry. We just had uh, Anthony Bourdain um, from CNN who is starting his program just about the San Martin province and this chocolate development because it's really a successful story and I, I hope I can change also the slides and it will be just good responses and not bad good responses. Um, and how the market makes a difference? And if the market makes a difference, and this is an example I want to share uh, with you, which is very close to, to my heart, because last week, just last week, I was uh, deep, deep in the Amazon forest, rainforest, in the province of Madre de Dios, in an um, area called Tampopata, La Reserva de Tampopata, and uh, I saw how really the market can make a difference not only as an export tool, but, only, but also can make a difference in people's life. Uh, so, uh, Brazil nut, and um, I brought some Brazil nut fresh from Peru on the table, and you can try the oil and some products from Brazil nut. So, Brazil nut is the flagship product, a flagship, yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is actually the nut, and uh, you have inside the, the nuts of the Brazil nut. Um, Marcus, if you can please pass it to us. So, um, Brazil nut is a flagship uh, product of the Madre de, de Dios province. And um, it represents almost 30% of the, almost 30% of all the people in Madre de Dios are directly or indirectly involved in this uh, business. And it represents, I think, more than 60% of their income. So everybody is, uh, if not Castanero, Castanero are the people who collect the nuts, so then uh, they work in these plants or in uh, these uh, just companies for, for Brazil nuts. Uh, and this is very important for this province of Madre de Dios because uh, this is a province, uh, the province which suffers uh, very much under illegal, um, illegal mining and um, informal also mining and illegal lodging. So you have almost the only one sustainable activity uh, for the older region, the entire regional, is uh, the Brazil nut. So commercialization, export and commercialization. Um, I just uh, read that 80% uh, of all the gold coming from Madre de Dios is illegal. So it's, it's, it's incredible. It's really a, it's, um, it's an illness uh, for, for all the region, and this is deep, deep in the Amazon forest. And when you fly, you can see the entire, it's a region, region more than Holland. It has the area more than Holland, which is deforestated and which is informal mining. 
and not only this, people are buying. Peru is one of the, uh, the biggest, the largest buyer for mercury, mercurio, mercury, exactly, mercury, and mercury is used also for this gold production, and of course all the mercury goes to the Amazon River. Uh, so now we can almost know we can't consume fish from the Amazon River because it's so point for poisonous mercury. So you can imagine how important that this uh, Brazil nut is for, for the region dealing with such a severe issues like deforestation and like informal mining. So I just uh, went there and I could uh, collect also some data. It's uh, just a sneak review of this. So we have all this like conventional, conventional and organic company. So I went there and I wanted to see first the economic uh, impact of this. Um, and uh, I asked people, how much do you get, for example, for a sack of this Brazil nut in a conventional company and how much you do for the same in an organic company? So the difference between this was not so much, it's like 30%. Uh, surprised me actually. Then I went to the companies where you have all these women, they're called peladoras, and these are the peelers, the, like the nut peelers. And I asked them, how much do you earn? All right. And uh, how much is the wage? So they say that for one kg, uh, kg, uh, one kg kilo. Yeah, kilo, uh, the difference is like 33%, which is kind of more. Uh, as economic uh, impact, and then there is also, you can see as a social impact, so all the people working in the organic or fair trade company are formally employed, they have medical and social insurance, which is 80% more of their total salary. Then because of the high quality standards which uh, people have within the plant, within the company, they are also, they have less, um, uh, they, they have been less uh, susceptible to, to infections. Um, there is also a diner offering uh, meals. They have also kind of the kindergartens or place for their children, which is very important because they are women, they are housewives uh, in, uh, within the, the plant. Um, so uh, there, there is a difference also not only on the economic aspect but also on a there is also social impact between the conventional and between an organic company. Um, as an environmental impact, uh, if you work for organic company, uh, you are obliged to do uh, uh, reforestation. So you're receiving these plants and they ask you to do a reforestation. Uh, also, if you work for organic company, you have to leave some of these nuts um, within your uh, your concession for regeneration of this Brazil nuts uh, tree forest. You do a better post-harvest management. There is not so many littering, so much littering. You do better better harvesting. Um, and this is some, some pictures I took of Don Manolo and so this uh, women who are peeling the nuts. Um, so this is something just to, to demonstrate you and uh, to show you that talking about organic, talking about fair trade is not uh, such an abstract con uh, concept and it's not only something which we or here like people in the Western societies in the US are experiencing. It has a real impact on people and um, I have been asking also people, um, but there's not so much money, why do you want to be organic? You know, you're getting just like 30% more or even 30% more. Why do you want to be? And they really, these are people who identify themselves with all these organic practices. They think that being organic makes them, uh, like the message, uh, makes them transfer, channel their message and their product to final customer. Like it's not uh, that their work is, will be vanished. No, there is a meaning. It's a really very, very strong meaning about this, which surprised me since Always one thinks that money is the biggest motivation, but no, it seems that there is something more, more than money in the uh, West. And then uh, since we're talking about economy, so what is actually the economy of the biodiversity? 
And um, here I will do some parallels also with some uh, world data. Uh, so biodiversity, and this is according to the Ministry of Environment in Peru, uh, represents 22% uh, of the country, country's GDP and 24% of its total exports. So everything what is biodiversity based. So, and then some examples, of course, you know that biodiversity is a base of a lot of industries world, in the world, not only in Peru. So you have agriculture, and approximately 65% of the national agriculture depends on native, just on native. And when I talk about native, it means uh, these are all the products uh, which have been in Peru before the, the Spanish people came to Peru or to Latin America. So which has been there, always there, in city. Uh, it's, uh, we have the tourism, which is a growing industry in Peru, and we're receiving more than 2 billion people per year, and ecotourism is, is large, is major now, and is growing. We have pharmaceutical industry, and for me it was interesting also to see that uh, Peruvian med uh, medicinal plants represent the active ingredient of various pharmaceutical products that global annual sales are estimated 400 billion US dollars. And um, this is only for Peru, but uh, if you want to see some world data, uh, I think the best uh, to look is the TIP report. Uh, report. TIP reports, uh, reports uh, this is the, the value of the ecosystem and biodiversity. It was a report uh, written by UNEP. Uh, this is the United Nations uh, Environmental Program. And actually it is uh, quite a major new <laughs> news uh, since for the first time uh, institution tried to put a value on biodiversity and biodiversity and ecosystem. Um, images of how much is the, the forest, flowers of forest worth, <laughs> how much uh, is the Machu Picchu worth, <laughs> or something like that. So uh, this um, this uh, report was uh, very important and kind of gave a lot of arguments to economists if they want not only to value the um, capital as an infrastructure, human capital, but if they want to value also natural capital. And of course, if you value something, you have also more, you appreciate more the cost of losing it. So it has been said that the cost of losing biodiversity and uh, biodiversity for industries are trillion and trillion of dollars. So if you want some more information, some more exact, uh, you can look the report is TEEB, TIP reports, and there are TIP reports for businesses, TIP reports for public sector. So it gives, it gave, it gave us a very good tools to see how much really is it worth. This is what we have. And, um, so talking about the market and talking about the economy, uh, we can uh, not uh, talk about the economy without talking about the market and of course we have all these favorable uh, market trends uh, towards uh, natural products, natural ingredients and you can see also some of the industries and uh, the size of market and uh, this is also from the TIP report, the Economics of Ecosystem of Biodiversity and the, the data is from 2009, so you can really freely add another 20% more. Uh, the organic market has a steady growth of 30% annually. Uh, I think there are very few industries, maybe Apple and Google, <laughs> these the blue chip industries, which can grow so much and uh, with such a steady, have such a steady growth such an uh, organic industry and all these natural based industries. So there is a very favorable market trend based on demand, customer demands. And when I talk about customer demands, this is US, this is Europe, Western Europe, and this is Japan and South Korea, which are like the major markets. And then biotrade. What do you think will be a bio-trade? 
do you think is the concept of bio trade? Mm -hmm. Do you have maybe any idea? Can you think of something? Yeah. Agricultural products. Yeah, and what else? Drugs. <laughs> yeah. And which other industry do you think is based on bio trade? Spots, you'll see that almost 80% of these biodiversity hotspots are located in developing countries. And if you do an overlapping on this map and the map I will show you now, this is the Gini index, the, the, the index of uh, inequality, you'll see also that again, it's proved that almost one of the most poor and equal countries are the, the most biodiversity, most biodiverse countries in the world. And this is still this untapped potential and this which we're going and which I want to, to show you. Uh, so it has been thought by a lot of institutions and mostly by United Nations Trade and Development Program that this biodiversity can be a very good uh, source or can, be, uh, can contribute to the conservation and protection of nature, of course. Can also create jobs and improve well-being of poor people. Can contribute to national economic growth through value adding. Can promote export and international exposure and can be also an overall solution to achieve uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, we have always had these two uh, school of, uh, of development of thoughts. Uh, one of them is uh, of people who will say, uh, you know, we want to preserve the biodiversity, the conservation, like the pure radical conservation, so don't touch it. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing of the biodiversity is, uh, it, it is meant to be there. And you have the other, so school like less radical, a little bit more liberal, and they say, you know, there is also a possibility to have a sustainable use of biodiversity, but also to do a very good conservation and protection job. So in this. And in uh, 1996, UNTAD, which is the United Nations Conference for Trade and Development, launched its uh, bio trade, bio trade initiative. In Spanish, it's called Bio Comercio. If you look for this, and uh, I will read uh, just uh, what uh, what is the formulation. Uh, bio trade refers to do those activities of collection, production transformation and commercialization of goods and services derived from native biodiversity under the criteria of environmental, social, and economic sustainability. So you're right uh, with everything. So maybe the only difference is that this is something which refers to native. So you can always like introduce species which are not so good for the biodiversity. So you have all the soya beans now in Brazil. So you have all this uh, like rice fields and other pro uh, products which are in a very like invasion, the invasive, invasive species. But you have also these native species. Uh, they have always been there and they are there and now there is a very strong market potential for this. There is a strong market demand. So why we don't do this, uh, this much of this? So the general objective of this BioTrade initiative was to promote trade and investment in biological resources for further sustainable development. And they had also three specific goals, the conservation, of uh, biodiversity in sustainable use and this fair and equitative benefits and sharing, sharing the benefits in fair and uh, equ equitative manner. The BioTrade uh, initiative is based on seven principles and um, I will not read for this, yeah, which is in the middle. It's for you, but you can see the mandate, the implementation, the applications and the approaches. 
and uh, the supported country countries for the initiative uh, Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Venezuela, Brazil, Vietnam, and Uganda. So mostly South American countries. And you have these supported sectors, which are the sector for natural products and ingredients, the cosmetic, the pharmaceutical, the garment industry, textile sector, handcrafts, and the eco or sustainable tourism sector. And um, I want to show you just a very a snapshot of a video, very small part of a video about the Biotrade Initiative from YouTube. Uh, maybe six minutes will be too long. I'll just show you two or three minutes, or that's it. Yes, okay. <laughs> okay. So you can see it's about Ecuador, so. Biodiversity has moved beyond pure nature conservation. It's now about using natural resources to further sustainable development. In Ecuador, one of the most biodiverse countries in the world, indigenous communities are benefiting from an initiative launched by the UN Conference on Trade and Development, known as BioTrade, which helps them improve their livelihoods by giving them access to new markets for their sustainably produced goods. high up in the Andes, has begun to rear alpacas, an environmentally friendly animal known for its fine and soft wool. Unlike horses, sheep and cows, the alpacas are ideally suited to the parable grasslands, as their hooves and teeth don't dig up the soil, which is an important source of water for the region. They were reintroduced to their native habitat a decade ago, but the local communities had lost their traditional knowledge on how to rear them. Now, Ecociencia, a local conservation organization, is helping them, as part of the Biotrade program, better manage the alpacas so that they can provide an alternative source of income. We're working on improving the quality of the wool so we can get the best price for this high grade material. <coughs> Once a year, the community gathers to shear the alpacas and graze their fleece for quality. It is a community effort. They are 40 teams to collect them all together. We then share the money we get with each other. At this handicraft center, the community is also reviving the ancient tradition of using natural dyes from wild plants and vegetables to better meet consumer demand for a range of colors. I'm passing on what I'm learning to my children so that when I stop doing this, they can continue the tradition. It's hoped that the project will act as an incentive for the younger generation to stay and work the land sustainably rather than migrate to the towns. But for that to happen, the farmers must be paid a fair price for their alpaca yarn. Finding markets for them is a key part of Ecociencia's work. Our added value is that we help the farmers find these markets, which are interested in helping preserve the environment, and which the farmers don't normally have access to. One market for the alpaca yarn is Pococha, a small business that makes top-of-the-range knitwear. Its founder, Lorena Perez, gave up her job as a nature guide to concentrate on helping poor women earn a decent income. It was, for me, a, like a dream to think working with an ecological animal with poor women in the mountains and with more women in the cities are in some work. Lorena has signed up to the UNTAD Biotrade Principles, which guarantee that her products preserve the environment and that her workers receive a fair salary. These three sisters earn seven times the going rate for their alpaca sweaters, dresses, and scarves. 
And I like this word because it is creative. And I can earn a living, work at home, and help my family. While rural communities are beginning to reap the benefits from the alpaca biotrade project, their involvement in the sustainable production of medicinal teas is well established. Since 2003, 600 families like that of Emilia Ducci have grown medicinal herbs for sale. We used to grow plants for our personal use, and plants like chamomile were considered weeds. But now we know the medicinal properties they have, we can sell them. The plants are sold to Hanley Kiwa, a producer's cooperative that offers the farmers a fair wage. Before, there always used to be a third party, and so the farmers didn't get a good price for their plants. But now, thanks to the buyer trade, they do. The herbs are packaged and sold as tea bags in supermarkets in Ecuador. But as with the alpaca yard, the main market is abroad. The the global fashion industry is responding to the demand for sustainable fashion. In an event organized by Unctad and Green to Greener in Geneva, models show off the latest creations from top designers, using natural and recycled materials from sustainable and ethical practices. Amongst the echo sheet creations gracing the catwalk was the alpaca dress designed by the culture. Depending on what sustainable fashion that you go for, in the case of this dress, it's really helping disenfranchise groups and a cultural craft that is preservation. I think you know all consumers can be philanthropists in a way, and if you do that through you know buying a beautiful dress, you're helping contribute to that. Fashion is increasingly not just about looking good, but about doing good too. In the future, through initiatives like Biotrade, it's hoped poor communities will find more market from the world stage for their sustainably produced wares. Inchi, 
which is uh, Sachechi actually is uh, from the Amazon forest and uh, is a nut that has the highest percentage of omega-6 and this is just fish uh, has more than this but nothing which is uh, based plant based has more omega-6 in the world uh, and we have it there and also there are a lot of products from food, cosmetics and uh, pharmaceutical industries in Europe in the United States that are based on Peruvian native products ice cream uh, vitamins cereal bars, chocolate, cosmetics. And why trade is also not only sold outside, but with these sales and export is beneficial for the community. You see the person, uh, these are real pictures, actually it's not, it's not the internet, it's a real picture, so that they, they say they plant the native cocoa, and uh, they do the Peruvian chocolate. Also, you have this vicuña, and you have seen the, the video about the alpacas in Ecuador. We have the same parallel, the same parallel can be made also the same industry with the vicuñas, which is the finest fiber in the world. And this is a company called Emenegil Dozenia. It's an Italian company, a very high fashion brand for uh, men uh, fashion. And actually, this is the owner of the company who is buying the entire Vicuña production from Peru and is paying very good and fair prices to, to, to people who have the Vicuñas. And uh, this is like partnerships, private, uh, private, public, and uh, civil society partnerships, which are beneficial from all the three sides. And now, why do I think that this is also a new model for relationship, for development between Peru and the EU? Uh, so, Peru is the key partner of uh, European Union and Latin America. The areas of work between the European Union and uh, the Peruvian government are uh, political dialogue, uh, trade and development uh, cooperation. For 2012, the bilateral trade was around uh, 9.1 billion uh, euros. This is in euros. Uh, and the EU exported around 2.3 billion to Peru. And when I say export, mostly the export of the EU are uh, um, machinery, uh, machinery uh, transport equipment, and imported around 5.1 billion. US dollar, which is uh, um, which is mainly fuels and mining products, but I'll tell you that now we have uh, diversified also the export basket, and uh, EU is the third largest source of import and the fourth destination for export of Peruvian products. And you can see also on the chart that Peru is number three of uh, exports to the European Union after Panama and Brazil. And uh, this, uh, in 2003, in uh, March of 2003, the free trade agreement between Peru, and actually Peru and Colombia, started, was launched, and uh, we have a lot of positive impact, which can be seen already, one of the impacts is the access to markets, of course. You have reduced or no tariffs for a lot of the uh, Peruvian uh, products. Uh, it also uh, has a positive uh, impact of attractive, attracting investments, promoting technological exchange, increasing imports and exports, and boosting innovation in general. Of course, there are positive consequences also for a local producer in agriculture, manufacturers in textile, clothing, and leather goods, and in mining. And you can already find a lot of Peruvian products in uh, German chains and the European and general chain. And you can see also it's a Peruvian chocolate from the Amazon uh, forest, and which is sold already in uh, Lidl. 
And since I want to uh, try to be objective and not only to present the positive, I want to present you also some of the critical issues. Uh, so what it is said that the free trade agreement is kind of very um, between asymmetrical <coughs> partners. So you have uh, Peru and European Union, you can imagine. So what is the, the way? Uh, also, um, what uh, civil society says that there is a very little impact what uh, the free trade agreement will have on the GDP growth, which is uh, said to be around 0.7%. By 2020. Mm -hmm. Also, we have human rights activists which said, and I will um, I will state from the report. Uh, it's a citation from the report. They put human rights in there, but there are no mechanism for sanctions in case of uh, violations. Of course, there is a lot of uh, going on about environmental damage, which uh, this relation can also produce. Of course, they say, human rights activists and environmental activists say that there will be an increased production of mining as, as a consequence, an increased number of social and environmental conflicts. It will be the growth in agriculture will increase pressure on land and water resources, and it will be an increased amount of wood production, which will increase, of course, deforestation. What I think, or my opinion, what will be the impact of FDA I think that first of all we'll have and we'll see high environmental level standards because this is already stated in all the partnerships agreement between Peruvian and EU companies starting from this year. Then I think that we'll see a lot of a lot more value added products. You know that we have again like all the Latin American countries this stigma that Peru is mostly a raw exporter, net raw material exporter. And there are very few value-added products which you can find in the European market now. So I think that will be over this raw material and we go to value-added products since there are no tariffs for this. But still we have a lot of tariffs for the raw materials. Then I think that we will see a lot of increase of non-traditional products which is already only to the U uh, European Union for 2013 and I saw the statistic uh, until September was 1 billion US dollars. So just from Peru to European Union and I'm talking about all these small products, not only the biodiversity native products, but in general products from Peru. We'll see also an increase in processed food, which is the same patterns, follow the same patterns of the value-added products. And of course, there will be a much more social impact in terms of creating jobs, new jobs, and more jobs, following income households. We'll see also, since this was the base of the uh, trade SIA, and trade SIA is the sustainability impact assessment report, which which was done before the signature of the agreement. And we'll see also much more compensation for indigenous group, for example, for using their biodiversity for small community. And uh, I think also that in general it will be beneficial for the agriculture com uh, communities from Asia, from Amazon uh, areas, uh, since uh, all the demand of these products is in the European Union and in general this will contribute also to a reduction of poverty. A really important to see the impact. Uh, how is the development cooperation? And just to present some uh, data and you can also check the link uh, below and see a little bit more details about this. Um, so between 2007 and 2013 Peru has received around 200 million EU funds, this is the total, uh, 102 million to fight drug trafficking, <laughs> it's a very important topic for us, 70 million for environmental issues like climate change, and actually next year we'll have in Peru the Euro climate change, and this is uh, very important also for us. Peru is one of the most um, country which suffers at most uh, under climate change and the conference will be in Lima next year. And we have some examples of this cooperation and one of the examples are the organic products, 
Uh, Peru is in the preferred list of developing world organic food suppliers for the EU. The EU is Peru's largest importer of organic foods, purchasing around 64% of its organic export. Principal destinations are Poland, Germany, Italy, and Switzerland. Switzerland actually is number one in per capita, uh, per capita purchasing. You have all this organic banana, coffee, cacao, and 70% of all the organic bananas produced in Peru are shipped to the EU for 2012. You have all this Inca bio trade, which is for the EU market. You have the market for quinoa, which is uh, this is the Indian grain with a lot of proteins. And you have beer from the Mongoza company, you have quinoa flakes, and you have this Inca superfoods. And you have also a very important project, which is a pilot project for Latin America that will start next year. And this is the Euro Ecotrade project. It will be in five uh, regions of Peru, and it will be, um, it will also encompass five products, I think there are five, bananas, mango, grains, and nuts, four, four products, four products, and it, will, it is a project that's uh, actually a funding from the European Union for 17 million US dollars just for development of this organic fair trade eco product lines. And this is a first pilot project in Latin America based on this ecological concept. And uh, they'll stay for four years in Peru, and I hope it will be a very successful, a successful project. And uh, before I leave you to buy your organic Peruvian chocolate, <laughs> just uh, some, some conclusions. Why do I think that this is so important in such a new moment in this European Peru-Latin American uh, relations. Um, so uh, Peru and EU have opened this uh, new and very um, persuasive way, persuasive way of greening the economy. Uh, you know the crisis, the economic and financial crisis in um, in uh, European Union. Peru is kind of this booming, growing economy. So it's not such a, a symmetrical. So Peru is not the Peru for 20 years. The Peru what we have now is much more like a stable partner, uh, economic and political partner. And uh, Peru also, and Latin America in general, has had always this political and cultural linkages to the European e Union. But now we have this new moment of rethinking uh, this economic policy. So what will be importing, what will be selling, what will be exporting? So what will be this new base for our relation where economy and sustainable development will match with like a perfect fit? And this is not only what politicians are thinking, but actually businesses are reinforcing, uh, motivating all this new uh, shift of paradigm, I, I would say, in this economic trade relationship uh, between Peru and, um, and uh, the European Union. Since this, this increased export, increased import, increased foreign direct uh, investment, technological, uh, technological transfer, and uh, increase interest in the pro in products from European Union for the Peruvian products and vice versa. So there is kind of a new pilot uh, project, a new pilot uh, model for sustainable trade relations. So it's not always Peru the raw material exporter and uh, the most sophisticated products from Latin America, but it's kind of we're sitting on the same table. And of course, they are. In my opinion, this represents an enormous opportunity, but also there, you can imagine there are a lot of challenges, of course, there are still barriers to trade, but uh, in general, I think that all this uh, bio-trade, organic, fair trade, sustainable trade practices represents, uh, in general, in total, uh, opportunity and a stepping stone for Peru. Uh, to place, uh, to have a completely different place, uh, not only political and cultural, but also an economic position and to strengthen this economic position in the EU dialogue.
Because talking about now biotrade, talking about EU and Latin America, uh, actually Brazil and Argentina are the most important countries. They have the highest uh, areas, the, uh, the largest areas of organic agriculture. They are, of course, one of the, the biggest countries in Latin America. And they still not a free trade agreement so with them, and I know that they are very resistant so also EU to be, Exactly, EU Mercosur. So they are very resistant. Um, I believe that uh, the more positive examples uh, we see in Latin America, like in the case of Peru, of uh, Colombia, uh, the more like positive intentions we'll see also from this government, which is like Brazil and Argentina in case of, of Organic. I don't want to touch now Venezuela and uh, Ecuador. I think we'll go on a completely different topic. But uh, I believe uh, trade uh, could be a very good uh, channel for for positive, bringing positive messages also to this um, this for resisting countries. Thank you. You can answer my part because I was about to ask about Brazil. Uh, but in the scenario, I don't know, uh, will stop Brazil to be uh, a competitor of them Peru on trade with the EU? You just mentioned that it's because they are resistant to have a free trade agreement. But uh, if that happens, what would be Peru's scenarios against Brazil? Because Brazil is uh, such a big country and it's. Uh, I would say it's the, it's one of the regional leaders uh, with the Latin America and uh, South America. So how would it look like for Peru competing against Brazil in this aspect? Yeah, um, you saw the statistic that uh, now Panama, uh, um, Paraguay, I think, is number one in export 
a European Union. Yeah, but this is, I think, just for um, its very momentum because actually Brazil is the biggest um, export partner of uh, EU. If you see the statistics, this is Brazil. Just what I was pointing at two different issues. You have these conventional products and you have like a more non-traditional, more sustainably made, produced and commercialized products. So nobody can compete Brazil in soya beans. Nobody can compete Brazil in conventional coffee. They're yeah, number one in the world. And also nobody can compete Brazil in uh, wood and uh, non-wooden uh, forest product. But I was talking here, you know that the examples of exporters not always have this positive effect. And you know, the soybeans and the deforestation, you know, the impact also on poverty and everything. So what I was more like uh, emphasizing, uh, emphasis, uh, emphasizing is that Peru, although without having all this potential as a trade potential what Brazil has, uh, is starting this new niche products where prices are higher, they are almost 30%. If you go to a store, you know that organic products is between two, uh, 20 and 30% more. So we know that we cannot compete with Brazil in the conventional products. They will eat us, like nobody can compete with China doing computers or whatever, doing coffees and uh, pencils. But um, exactly, niche markets. But what we are pointing that there is products, textile, handcraft, and so, which are if produced in sustainably manner, the customers are ready to pay this surplus. And um, this is what we are aiming, what we are aiming so to, to develop our markets towards this niche, niche markets. So, so that's mass because you can't exactly. compete with mass, but rather quality exactly. and niche exactly. products. Exactly. Exactly. The Highland stuff that Brazil doesn't have to do. Exactly. The Highland product. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that. Uh, oh, so you mentioned that there are some some bad things from free trade. Were you referring to the traditional or the non traditional ones? In general, in general, you can still not measure impact from free trade because it was already started, it was March in 2013 in May. So it was March five to two years ago, but like this is now. Um, this uh, is called Trade CS, and actually the European Union is the only trade block that does this uh, trade, sustainability trade uh, assessments. So they measure potentially how will be the impact on poverty, how will be the impact on the environment, and so on. What I was, um, what I was uh, uh, mentioning and uh, showing was more uh, critical issues from civil society. So there was this, always, you know, the balance of the society, the, our conscious <laughs> as a civil society. So this is more of what, uh, what civil society thinks the potential impact will be. But um, up to now, the general opinion is rather positive, I'll say, than, than negative. So it was really uh, the, the agreement, and I read some resumes of the trade agreement, was done in a very uh, delicate and diplomatic way. So it will be a win-win agreement for both countries. So, yeah. um, so I have a question about the native products. I know that we don't have a lot of our products, right? And when we have free trade agreements and one of them, a lot of our native things are um, medically modified and then they patent them and then we have to compete against that. Do we have any kind of like um, protection from that with the agreement of that sign? Do you know? So the question is more about the genetic modified or more yeah. about the Peru is uh, Peru has a ban on genetically modified foods, so we don't have any genetically modified foods, so we are okay with this. <laughs> so it's one of the few countries which doesn't have the GMO foods. But about uh, patents and so, uh, 
you know, I don't my topic about these native products and I know that there's not a lot of problems, we don't have problems. We have more problems in Chile and now we say that the pisco sour is from Peru and the Chilean have say that this is on a chili moya, which is another product, is more, but not so much of the European, pro, uh, European Union because it's something so, so native, so uh, like Latin America, so like patents is, um, it's not something which is so spread. And you cannot, I mean, if you really try to do the market organic, I mean, just you know, to comment on that, right? You cannot really GMO modify that food and still call it organic. Do you know what I'm saying? So you basically, if you, that's a very smart way, you almost patent it by labeling it. I don't know if there's some official certification approval for any product, or is there, do they adopt, you know, international? Yeah. You, know, they you, do that? you know what I mean? Yeah. You, need a, you need the organic certification only when you export. They still, unfortunately, in Peru, they still not a market for organic products. Um, it's more, I'm sure that in none of the develop, developing countries there is a market for sustainably produced products, unfortunately. There are still these high-end markets that can afford paying the 30% more, but the generally, I see now in some of the stores this like more natural sections, but still, you know, you have this relation with the we call it caserita, with the women uh, who will bring to you the milk, will bring to you the fruits. So mm, it's not so, it's not this anonymous uh, relation. So, and still prices matter a lot. Still there is not a market for fair trade products in developing countries. You cannot find even in India such a market, local market. So everything is getting exported to more high-end markets. Unfortunately, I hope this will change. Um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, how workers are organized? Mm -hmm. And also, uh, since you mentioned like there's a lot of uh, organic uh, products, and uh, I just think that it implies to have a big company that is doing all of that, but with the help of the native people. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure, like, it, which is the relationship between the worker and the, the company and the multinational, yeah, or if or how the native people get benefited, truly benefited by this new opportunities, or if it's in like a comparative way, how, how does it work? How does that mean about that? Um, yeah, I would put it again, it is bio trades, and uh, unfortunately, we still don't have from multinational companies working in bio trade. Mostly, it's a uh, very small companies with a turnover from two to ten million US dollars, but mostly small growing companies or national companies okay. that are exporting, like big international, yeah. multinational. Yeah. In bio trade, in bio trade, you don't have this. Now I see Old some of <laughs> you don't have Moscow, you don't have. Protel and Campbell doing organic uh, quinoa soap or so. <laughs> yeah, or Costco. So, you know, since it is such a like, small industry, and uh, you have, of course, this the businessman who is leading the industry, but um, bio trade and all this organic agriculture, fair trade is based on some principles. And you have to obey to these principles, to these criteria, otherwise, you will not get the certification. So, um, how called um, on default, <laughs> this is uh, see, uh, this is already done. You know, like the social, the environmental, and the economic uh, equity uh, benefit and sharing is already because you're certified for default. So you okay. have it. You have it. And even if you're a multinational company, now there are a lot of multinational companies, and Walford is, is a very Walford is a very big company. And uh, if you need, want to be organic, you have to you have to follow the, the principles of this organic agriculture. So you have a certification for uh, for commercialization of a certain product, or you have a certification for for, for uh, production of certain products. But it's, it's No, thank you very much for coming, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.